اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین الرحمن الرحیم مالک یوم الدین ایا کا نعبد و ایا کا نستعین اہدن سرات المستقیم سرات اللذین انعمت علیہم غیر المغضوب علیہم ولدالین آمین In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, Dr. William Campbell, Dr. Zakir Naik, Dr. Mazakus, Dr. Jamal Badawi, Dr. Samuel Naman, and Mr. Sam Shamoon. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace and blessings of Almighty Allah be upon all of you. On behalf of the organizers, the Islamic Circle of North America, I, Sayyid Sabil Ahmed, welcome all of you to this unique event, a dialogue on the topic, the Quran, the Bible, in the light of science. Again, on behalf of Dr. Campbell, Dr. Zakir Naik, Islamic Circle of North America, this dialogue is being held in a spirit of friendship, understanding each other's viewpoints. A brief introduction of ICNA's activities, Islamic Circle of North America. The goals of Islamic Circle of North America are to motivate Muslims to perform their duty of being witnesses unto mankind offering educational training opportunities to increase the Islamic knowledge and to enhance the character. ICNA is also active in opposing immorality and oppression of all forms, supporting efforts for socioeconomic justice, civil liberties in the society, strengthening the bond of humanity by serving all those in need anywhere in the world with special focus on our neighborhood across North America. For today's unique dialogue, the two main moderators are Dr. Mohammed Naik, representing Dr. Zakir Naik, and Dr. Samuel Nauman, representing Dr. William Campbell. It is my duty to ensure a fair and proper conduct of this meeting. Therefore, we request our speakers as well as the audience to maintain due decorum for a healthy dialogue. With that, I would request Dr. Samuel Nauman to give the introduction of Dr. William Campbell. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Brother Sabil Ahmed. It's a pleasure and honor to be here with you this evening. And uh, first of all, I myself, with a group of our uh, brothers and sisters from the Christian background really like to thank the Islamic Circle of North America and uh, the local people who have organized this unique event. They have done a great job. They have worked very hard. And now we have come to the last moment to be here. Dr. William Campbell did his medical work in Cleveland, Ohio at Case Western U Reserve University. He worked for 20 years in Morocco where he learned Arabic, after seven years in Tunisia, he wrote his book, Answering Dr. Maurice Bukhais. He is a convinced Christian who likes to explain the Injil or the Gospel to everyone. At age 74, Dr. Campbell is retired with 10 grandchildren. And we are really thankful and we are really happy to be here with you tonight. Thank you. On behalf of the Islamic Research Foundation, I, Dr. Muhammad Naik, am pleased to be amongst you all along with Dr. Zakir. It's a pleasure to be here for this unique event and have the good pleasure of having scholars like Dr. William Campbell, Dr. Jamal Badawi, Dr. Mazakas, as well as my co-colleague, 
Brother Dr. Samuel Naman, you're with us. I, on behalf of Brother Samuel and myself, present the format for the dialogue. The format as agreed and decided fair by both our speakers is, Dr. William Campbell would first address you for 55 minutes on the topic, the Quran and the Bible in the light of science. Then Dr. Zakir Naik at the far end would make his presentation for 55 minutes on the same topic. This would be followed by a response session in which Dr. Campbell would respond to the matter presented by Dr. Zakir for 25 minutes, followed by Dr. Zakir too responding for 25 minutes to the matter presented by Dr. Campbell. Lastly, we would have the open question and answer session in which the audience may pose questions to each speaker alternately on the question mics provided in the auditorium. After the mics, questions are handled. We would allow questions on index cards to be provided by volunteers in the aisles and in the order selected at random by the coordinators and the advisors to each of the speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, to address you today, Dr. William Campbell. Greeting to Dr. Nike, who came, almost surely came the farthest. Greeting to Sabil Ahmed and Mohammed Nike, and greeting to the organizing committee. Calling this the ultimate dialogue is a bit of an exaggeration, but it is good advertising. And greetings to you, the audience. I'd like to also bring greetings in the name of Yahweh, or better known as Jehovah, the great creator God who loves us. I wish to start by speaking about words. Tonight we are going to speak about the words of the Bible and the words of the Koran. The scholars of modern linguistics tell us a word, a phrase, or a sentence means what it meant to the speaker and the person or crowd of people listening. In the case of the Koran, what it meant to Mohammed and the, those listening to him. In the case of the Bible, what it meant to Moses or Jesus or those listening to them. To check this, we have the context of all the usages in the Bible or the Koran. In addition, there is the poetry and letters of that century. For the Gospel, the first century AD. For the Koran, the first century of the Hejra. If we are going to follow the truth, we may not make up new meanings. If we are seriously after truth, there are no permissible lies. Here is an example of what I am talking about. You can have the first slide here. This is talking about two dictionaries that I have in my home, one from 1951 and 1991. In these two dictionaries, the first meaning, pig, a young swine of either sex, is the same. The second meaning, any swine or hog, any wild or domestic swine, it's the same. Third, the flesh of swine, pork, is the same. Then the, the meaning, a person or animal of piggish habits, it's the same. A person who is gluttonous. And down here, pouring metal into a pig for pig iron is the same. But over here is a new meaning, a police officer. You need to call the police officers pigs. All right, the question is, in the Torah, it says you can't eat pigs. Well, can I turn around and say, oh, yes, that means police officers. You can't eat police officers. Of course not. In the Koran, Allah says can't eat pigs. Can I translate it, can't eat put police officers? No. It's wrong. It would be stupid. It would be lying, actually. Mohammed did not mean police officers. Moses did not mean police officers. 
We may not have any new meanings. We must use the meanings known in the first century AD for the Bible, or that is for the gospel, and the first century of the Hazra for the Koran. Now let us look at what the Koran is going, says about embryology. Oh, sorry, got the wrong thing. It has been said that the idea of the embryo developing through stages is a modern one, and that the Koran is anticipating modern embryology by depicting differing stages. In a pamphlet entitled Highlights of Human Embryology by Keith Moore, Dr. Moore claims the realization that the embryo develops in stages in the uterus was not discussed or illustrated until the 15th century. We will weigh this claim by considering the meaning of the Arabic words used by the Koran, and secondly, by examining the historical situation leading up to and surrounding the Koran. We will start by looking at the main words using the word alaka, main verses. The Arabic word alaka in the singular, or alak as the collective plural, is used six times. In the Surah of the Resurrection, al qiyama 75, 35 to 39, we read, was he man, not a drop of sperm ejaculated? Then he became alaka, and God shaped and formed and made of him a pair, the male and the female. In the Surah of the Believer, al mumin 4067, it says, He it is who created you from dust, then from a sperm drop, then from a leech-like clot, alaka, then brings you forth as a child, that perhaps you may understand. In the Surah of the Pilgrimage, Al-Hajj 22.5, it says, O mankind, if you have doubt about the resurrection, consider that we have created you from dust, then from a drop of seed, then from a clot, alaka, then from a little lump of flesh, shapely and shapeless. And finally, the fullest treatment is in the Surah of the Believers, al Mu'minun, 23, 12 to 14, which reads, Verily, we created man from a product of wet earth, then placed him as a drop of seed in a safe lodging, then we fashioned the drop of clot, alaka, and of the clot we fashioned a lump, and of the lump we fashioned bones, and we clothed the bones with meat. Then we produced it as another creation. And here you have the stages according to the Koran. Nutfa sperm, alaka clot, mudaga piece of meat, adam bones, and the fifth stage dressing the bones with muscles. Over the last hundred plus years, this word alaka has been translated as follows. There's 10 translations here. I'm not going to read them all. Three are in French, where it says un gomo de sang, or a clot of blood. Three versions, five versions are English, where it's either clot or leech-like clot. One version is in Indonesian, at the bottom there, sigum paldara, lump of or clot of blood. And the last one is Farsi, khun basta, a clot of blood. As every reader who has studied human reproduction will realize, there is no stage as a clot during the formation of a fetus. So this, so this is a very major scientific problem. In the dictionaries of Wur and Abdenur, the only meanings given for alaka in this sem feminine singular are clot and leech. And in North Africa, both of these meanings are still used. Many patients have come to me to ask for a clot to be removed from their throat. And many women have come to me and told me their period didn't come. When I say, I'm sorry, I can't give you medicine to bring your period because I believe that's a baby, they would say, mazel dim, it's still blood. So they were understanding these ideas of the Koran. Lastly, we must consider the first verses which came to Muhammad in Mecca. These are found in the 96th surah called alaq, clots from the very word that we're studying. In 96.1.2 we read, proclaim, in the name of your Lord who created, created man from Alak. Here the word is in the collective plural. This form of the word can have other meanings because Alak is also the derived verbal noun of the verb alika. The verbal noun usually corresponds to the gerund in English, as in the sentence, swimming is fun. 
Therefore, we could expect it to mean hanging or clinging or adhering. But the 10 translators listed above have all used clot or congealed blood in this verse too. In spite of the number and qualifications of these translators who use the word clot, the French doctor Maurice Bucay has sharp words for them. He writes, what is more likely to mislead the inquiring reader is once again the problem of vocabulary. The majority of translations describe, for example, man's formation from a blood clot. A statement of this kind is totally unacceptable to scientists specializing in the field. This shows how great the importance of an association between linguistic and scientific knowledge is when it comes to grasping the meaning of Quranic statements on reproduction. Put in other words, Bukai is saying, nobody has translated the Quran correctly until I, Dr. Bukai, came along. How does Dr. Bukai think that it should be translated? He proposes that instead of clot, the word alaka should be translated as something which clings, which would refer to the fetus being attached to the uterus through the placenta. But as all you ladies who've been pregnant know, the thing which clings doesn't stop its clinging to become chewed meat. It keeps on being the thing which clings, which is attached by the placenta for eight and a half months. Thirdly, these verses say that the chewed meat becomes bones, and then the bones are covered with muscle. They give the impression that first the skeleton is formed, and then it is clothed with flesh, and Dr. Bukai knows perfectly well that this is not true. The muscles and the cartilage precursors of the bones start forming from the somite at the same time. At the end of the eighth week, there are only a few centers of ossification started, but the fetus is already able to make muscular movement. In a personal letter from Dr. T.W. Sadler, who's associate professor in, embryo in anatomy and the author of Langman's Medical Embryology, Dr. Stad Sadler states, at the eighth week post-fertilization, the ribs would be cartilaginous, not bone, and muscles would be present. Also at this time, ossification would just begin. Muscles would be capable of some movement at eight weeks. It's always better to have two witnesses, so we shall see what Dr. Keith Moore has to say about the development of bones and muscles in his book, The De Developing Human. Extracted from chapters 15 and 17, we find the following information. The skeletal, skeletal system develops from mesoderm. The limb muscles develop in the limb buds that are derived from this somatic mesoderm. We see that here on this slide. It's difficult perhaps to see, but there's the limb bud. And then here there's just a little bit of cartilage with the muscles around. Here there's more cartilage. And this is the whole, bu the bones are formed and in the form of bones, but it's all cartilage, no bones yet. This second slide shows how it forms. Here's, a, here's the cartilage. Now, just the bone is, looks like cart cartilage. And then it starts to have some calcium deposited. And then it starts to have ossification and bone form. As the bone models form, sorry. I want to go back to this. As the bone models form, Myoblasts develop a large muscle mass in each limb bud, separating into extensor and flexor muscles. In other words, the limb muscles develop simultaneously from the mesenchyme surrounding the developing bones. So there's the cartilage, and here are the muscles developing around the cartilage. During a personal conversation with Dr. Moore, I showed him Dr. Sadler's statement, and he agreed that it was absolutely valid. Conclusion, Dr. Sadler and Dr. Moore agree. There is no time when calcified bones have been formed and then the muscles are placed around them. The muscles are there several weeks before there are calcified bones, rather than being added around previously formed bones as the Koran states. The Koran is in complete error here. The problems are far from being solved. Let us fully return to Alaka. Dr. Moore also has a suggestion. 
he says another verse in the Quran refers to the leech-like appearance and the chewed-like stages of human development. From this definition, Dr. Moore has gone ahead to propose that a 23-day 23 23-day embryo, three millimeters long, that's an eighth of an inch. I can hardly put my fingers that close together without touching. This is Carnegie Stage 10, shown on the inside cover of Moore's book. This is the beginning, and here's the sperm entering the egg. So that's stage one. Comes down here to stage six in the second week. And here is the third week. And there, it's, there's stage 10, and here is day 23. And this is what Dr. Moore wants to say looks like a leech. If we look further, though, and look at the x-ray, Here's day 22, and the backbone is still open. And when we look at day 23, the backbone is open there, and it's open there, and the head is wide open. It doesn't look like a leech at all. And if you keep on, and this, this is a diagram of it. The head is open. They're not rostral neuropore. And finally, this diagram shows there's the, there is the 20-day the embryo. It's got a yolk sac, it's got an umbilicus, it doesn't look like a leech at all. The problem, the great problem with these new definitions for the word alaka is that no confirming examples have been provided from the Arab, Arabic use in the centuries surrounding the Hejra. The only way to establish the meaning of the word is by usage. The only way to establish whether the singular form alaka can mean a three millimeter embryo or the thing that clings is to bring sentences demonstrating this usage from the literature of the Arabs of Mecca and Medina close to the time of Mohammed, especially from the language of the Quraysh. This will not be an easy task because much work has already been done on the clear Arabic of the Quraysh. The early Muslims understood intuitively the need to know exactly what the Quranic words mean. And for this reason, they made comprehensive studies of their language and poetry. Hamza Boubacar, former rector of the main mosque in Paris, brought up this subject at a conference on the One God in Montpellier in 1985. He posed the question to the audience, has the comprehension of the text of the Quran known at the time of Mohammed remained stable? And his answer was, ancient poetry shows that it has. We can only, only conclude, if the verses which bring spiritual comfort and hope to Muslims have remained stable, then the scientific statements embedded in those verses must also be accepted as stable, unless new evidence can be brought forward. This is especially important since some of the verses say that this information is a sign. The Surah of the Believer, as we saw above, says he, is, he it is who created you from dust, then from a sperm drop, then from a clot, alaka, that perhaps you may understand. And in the Surah of the Pilgrimage, he said, O mankind, if you have doubt about the resurrection, consider. Therefore, the question must be asked, asked, if it was a clear sign to the men and women of Mecca and Medina, what did they understand from the word alaka? which would lead them to faith in the resurrection? The answer. We are going to examine the historical situation leading up to the time of Mohammed to see what Mohammed and his people believed about embryology. We will start with Hippocrates. According to the best evidence, he was born on the Greek island of Kos in 460 BC. And he has stages. His stages are as follows. The sperm is a product which comes from the whole body of each parent. Weak sperm coming from the weak parts and strong sperm from the strong parts. Then he goes ahead and talks about the coagulation of the mother's blood. The seed embryo then is contained in a membrane. Moreover, it grows because of its mother's blood, which descends to the womb. For once a woman conceives, she ceases to menstruate. Then about flesh, 
He says at this stage, with the descent and coagulation of the mother's blood, flesh begins to form, with the, be formed with the umbilicus. And lastly, bones, he says, as the flesh grows, it is formed into distinct members by breath. The bones grow hard like a, and send out branches like a tree. Next, we will look at Aristotle. In his book on the generation of animals, sometime about 350 BC, he gives his stages of embryology. And he talks about first semen and menstrual blood, or catamenia. In this section, Aristotle speaks of the male semen as being in a pure state. It follows that what the female would contribute to the semen of the male would be material for the semen to work on. In other words, the semen clots the menstrual blood. Then he goes to flesh. He says, nature forms this from the purest material, the flesh and from the residue thereof it forms bones. And lastly, around the flesh, around the bones, and attached to them by thin fibrous bands, grow the fleshly parts. Clearly, the Koran follows this exactly. Sperm clotting the menstrual blood, which forms meat, then the bones are formed, and lastly, around about the bones, grow the fleshly parts. Next, we will consider Indian medicine. The, in, the opinion of Sharaka in 123 AD and Susruta is that both the male and female contributed seed. The secretion of the male is called the sukra, semen. The secretion of the woman is called artava or sanita, blood. And it is derived from the blood by way of food, by way of blood. Here we see that in the medicine of India, they too had the idea that the child was formed from semen and blood. Now we shall look at Galen. Galen was born in 131 AD in Pergamum, modern Pergamum in Turkey. Galen says on semen, the substance from which the fetus is formed is not merely menstrual blood, as Aristotle maintained, but menstrual blood plus the two semens. The Koran agrees with Galen here when it says in Surah 76.2, we created man from a drop of mingled sperm. Now we'll look at the Galen stages. Galen also taught that the embryo developed in stages. The first is that in which the form of the semen prevails. The next stage is when it has been filled with blood and heart and brain and liver are still unarticulated and unshaped. This is the period that Hippocrates called fetus. The Quranic Surah 22.5 reflects this saying then out of a morsel of flesh partly formed and partly unformed. And now the third period of gestation has come. This, thus it, it, nature caused flesh to grow on and around all the bones. We saw above that the Quran agrees with this in Surah 23, 14, where it says, and we clothe the bones with meat. The fourth and final period Sorry, the fourth and final period is at the stage when all the parts of the, in the limbs have been differentiated. Galen was so important in medicine that just about the time of the Hejra, four leading medical men in Alexandria, Egypt, decided to form a medical school using 16 books of Galen as the basis of the studies. This considered, continued up to and including the 13th century. We must now ask ourselves, what was the political, economic, and medical situation in Arabia at the time of Mohammed? From the Hadramaut in Yemen, the caravans of the spice trade passed north through Mecca and Medina and then reached into all of Europe. In North Arabia, in about 500 AD, the Ghassanids took over, and by 528, they controlled the Syrian desert over to the outskirts of Medina. Syriac, a form of Aramaic related to Arabic, was their official language. As early as 463, the Jews translated the Torah and Old Testament from Hebrew into Syriac. The British Museum has a copy. This made it available to the Ghassan, who were Christians, and to the Jewish tribes in Arabia. During this time, Sergius el Rasaini, who died in Constantinople in 536, 
one of the earliest and greatest translators from Greek into Syriac, translated various works on medicine, including 26 works of Galen. This made them available in the kingdom of Khosru I in Persia and to the Ghassan tribe whose influence extended to the outskirts of Medina. Khosru I, Arabic Kisra, king of Persia, was known as Khosru the Great. His troops conquered areas as far away as Yemen, and he also loved learning and started several schools. The school of Jundishapur became, during Khosru I's long reign of 48 years, the greatest intellectual center of the time. Within its walls, Greek, Jewish, Nestorian, Persian, and Hindu thought and experience were freely exchanged. Teaching was done largely in Syriac, from Syriac translations of Greek texts. This meant that Aristotle, Hippocrates, and Galen were readily available when the medical school at Jindishapur was operating during his reign. The next step was that the conquering Arabs compelled the Nestorians to translate their Syriac texts of Greek medicine into Arabic. The translation from Syriac to Arabic was easy, as the two languages had the same grammar. Concerning the local medical situation during Muhammad's life, we know there were physicians living in Arabia during this period. Harith ben Kalada was the best educated physician trained in the healing arts. He was born about the middle of the 6th century at Taif in the tribe of Bani Thaqif. He traveled through Yemen and then Persia where he received his education in the medical sciences at the great medical school of Jindishapur and thus was intimately acquainted with the medical teachings of Aristotle, Hippocrates, and Galen. Having completed his studies, he practiced as a physician in Persia, and during this time he was called to the court of King Khosru, with whom he had a long conversation. He came back to Arabia about the beginning of Islam and settled down at Taif. While there, Abu al-Khair, a king of Yemen, came to see him in connection with a certain disease and on being cured, rewarded him with much money and a slave girl. Though Harith bin Kalada did not write any book on medicine, his views on many medical problems are preserved in his conversation with Khosru. About the eye, he says that it is constituted of fat, which is the white part. About the, and then the second is constituted with water, which is the black part, and of wind, which constitutes the eyesight. Well, these things we know to be wrong now, but this was Greek thought. All this goes to show the acquaintance of Harith with the Greek doctors. Summarizing the situation in a few words in his book, Histoire de la Médecine Arabe, Dr. Lucien Leclerc writes, Harith ben Kalada studied medicine at Jandi Shapur, and Muhammad owed to Harith a part of his medical knowledge. Thus with, with the, thus, with the one as well as the other, we easily recognize the traces of Greek medicine. Sometimes Muhammad treated the sick, but in the difficult cases, he would send the patients to Hari. Another educated man, person around Muhammad was Nadir bin Harith. Not related to the doctor, he was a Karashite and cousin of Muhammad and had also visited the court of Khosru. He had learned Persian and music, which he introduced among the Quraysh at, Me at Mecca. However, he was not sympathetic to Muhammad, mocking some of the stories in the Quran. Muhammad never forgave him for this, and when he was taken prisoner at the Battle of Bader, he caused him to be put to death. In summary, we see that one, Arabs living in Mecca and Medina in 600 had political and economic relations with people from Ethiopia, Yemen, Persia, and Byzantine. A cousin of Muhammad knew Persian well enough to do his musical studies in it. Three, the Ghassan tribe, which ruled the Syrian desert over to the gates of Medina, used Syriac, one of the main languages used to teach medicine in Jindi Shapur as their official language. An ill king of Yemen came to Taif to consult the physician Harith ben Kalada, who had been trained where? At Jindi Shapur, the best medical school in that world, and to whom Muhammad sometimes sent patients. Five, during Muhammad's lifetime, a new medical school was established in Alexandria using the 16 books of Galen as their texts. This all shows that there was ample opportunity for Muhammad and the people around him to have heard of the embryological theories of Aristotle, 
Hippocrates and Galen when they went to seek treatment from Harith ben Kalada and other local doctors. Thus, when the Quran says in the late Mekansur of the Believer, 4067, he it is who created you from dust, then from a sperm drop, then from a leech-like clot, that perhaps you may understand. And then in the Surah of the Pilgrimage, O mankind, if you have doubt about the resurrection, consider what we have created, that we have created you from dust. It is correct for us to ask again, what were they to understand? What were they to consider? And here are the Quranic stages again. Nutfa sperm, alaka clot, mudaga piece of meat, adam bones, and five, dressing the bones with muscles. The answer is very clear. They were understanding and considering that which was common knowledge, the embryological stages as taught by the Greek physicians. I don't mean that Mohammed's listeners all knew the names of the Greek physicians, but they knew the embryological stages of the Greek physicians. They believed that the male sperm mixed with the female menstrual blood to cause it to clot, and this, be this became the baby. Two, they believed there was a time when the fetus was formed and unformed. Three, they believed the bones formed first and then were covered with muscle. Allah was using that common knowledge as a sign encouraging the listeners and readers to turn to him. The trouble is that this common knowledge was and is not true. Arab physicians after Muhammad. We must now look at two well-known physicians from the period after Muhammad. Obviously, they had no effect on the Quran, but they demonstrated that faith in the embryological ideas of Aristotle, Hippocrates, and Galen continued among the Arabs right up to the 1600s. If the correct translation of alaka is leech-like substance, as modern Muslims like Shabir Ali claim, there is no place where these post-Quranic doctors said so. In fact, it's just the opposite. The ideas of these Greek physicians were being used to explain the Koran, and the Koran was quoted to enlighten the meaning of the Greek physicians. The human being takes its origin from two, this is speaking about Ibn Asina or Avicenna. The human being takes its origin from two things, the male sperm, which plays the part of factor, the female sperm, first part of the menstrual blood, which provides the matter. Thus we see that Ibn Sina gave the female semen exactly the same role that Aristotle had assigned to the menstrual blood. It is difficult to overstate the importance of Ibn Sina as a scientific and philosophical authority for the pre-modern Europeans. Then we're going to look at Ibn Qayyim al jawziya Ibn Qayyim took full advantage of the agreement between Quranic revelation and Greek medicine. This is not very clear, probably, but the Hippocrates is in purplish, and the Quran is in bold type, green, and the Hadith is in purple, and commentaries are in red, and his own thoughts in sort of a blue-green. So it starts out, he's Giving, he says, Hippocrates said in the third chapter of Kitab al-Jinnah, al Ajinna, the semen is contained in a membrane and it grows because of the blood of its mother which descends to the womb. Some membranes are formed at the beginning, others after the second month, and others in the third month. And this phrase about the blood descending to the womb, we saw it when we looked at Hippocrates' slide. That is why God said, here the Quran is mentioned. He creates you in the womb of your mothers by one formation after another in three darknesses. That's Quran 39.6. Then he gives his own ideas. Since each of these membranes has its own darkness, when God mentioned the stages of creation and transformation from one state to another, he also mentioned the darknesses of the membranes. Most commentators explain, and here are the words of the commentators. It is the darkness of the belly and the darkness of the womb and the darkness of the placenta. In a second example, we read, Hippocrates said, the mouth opens up spontaneously and the nose and ears are formed from the flesh. The ears are opened and the eyes which are filled with a clear liquid. The prophet used to say, I worship him who made my face and formed it and opened my hearing and I say, and so forth. 
Here we look at Hippocrates again. And there in the second stage is the same thing we just read. Ibn al-Qayyim is quoting Hippocrates and speaks of the mother's blood descends around the membrane. He could do this, as we have seen, because the educated people of Muhammad's time were familiar with Greek medicine. However, what is important for us here today to realize is that there is no place where the Koran corrected Greek medicine. There is no place where Ibn Qayyim was shouting, hey, you guys, you've got it this all wrong. The correct meaning of alaka is that which clings or leech-like substance. On the contrary, Ibn Qayyim was demonstrating the agreement between the Koran and the Greek medicine, their agreement in error. A final witness is the commentary of Baydawi in 1200 AD. Here we have the commentary. We have the, 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 we have the Koran here. We have his, his commentary. And here it's been translated. And he says, then from Alaka, a piece of solid blood is his explanation of Alaka. Alaka is underlined. That's from the Koran. And here's his explanation, a piece of solid blood. Then he goes on then from a piece of meat from the Koran. A piece of meat originally as much as can be chewed and so forth. As I mentioned at the beginning of this study, it has been said that the idea of the embryo developing through stages is a modern one and that the Koran is anticipating modern, modern embryology by depicting differing stages. Yet we have seen that Aristotle, Hippocrates, the Indians, and Galen have all discussed the stages of embryological development during the thousand years before the Quran. And after the coming of the Quran, the account of the different stages as described by the Quran and the Greek doctors was carried on in the teachings of Avicenna and Ibn Qayyim and is essentially the same as that taught by Galen and those preceding him. Concerning, concerning the bone stage, it's clear as Dr. Moore demonstrated so capably in his textbook, that muscles start forming from the somites at the same time as the cartilage models of the bones. There's no bone stage where there's a skeleton sitting here and then, and then the, the, the muscles are plastered around it. It's equally clear that alaka in the Quran means clot and that the Quraysh who heard Muhammad speaking understood him to be referring to the menstrual blood as the female contribution to the developing baby. Therefore, we can conclude that during all these years, the Quranic verses on embryology, saying that man is created from a drop of sperm, which becomes a clot, were in perfect accord with the science of the first century of the Hejra, of the time of the Quran. But when compared with the modern science of the 20th century, Hippocrates is in error, Aristotle is in error, Galen is in error, and the Quran is in error. They are all in serious error. Now we're going to look at a little bit about moonlight. Does the Quran state that the moon gives off reflected light from the sun? Before this was common knowledge. In the Surah of Noah, 71, 15, 16, it says, See ye not how Allah has created the seven heavens one above another, and made the moon a light, nur, in their midst, and made the sun as a lamp, siraj? The moon is called a light, Arabic nur, and the sun a lamp, siraj. Some Muslims claim that since the Quran uses different words, speaking from about the light of the sun and the light of the moon, it reveals that the sun is a source of light, while the moon only reflects light. This claim is implied very strongly by Shabir Ali in his booklet, Science in the Quran, and stated clearly by Dr. Zakir Naik in his video, is the Quran God's word, as you will now see clearly. The light that we have, the light that we obtain from the moon, where does it come from? So he will tell me that previously we thought 
that the light of the moon was its own light. But today, after science has advanced, we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it's a reflected light of the sun. I will ask him a question. That it is mentioned in this Quran, in Surah Al Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61. Blessed is he who has created the constellation and placed therein a lamp and a moon which has reflected light. The Arabic word for moon is Qamar. And the light described there is Munir, which is borrowed light, or Noor, which is a reflection of light. The Quran mentions that the light of the moon is reflected light. You say you discovered it today. How come it's mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago? He will pause for a time. He won't reply immediately. And then may say, maybe, maybe it's a fluke. I don't argue with him. For sake. Near the end of the video, we heard Dr. Naik explain the Arabic word for moon is Qamar. And the light described there is Munir, which is borrowed light, or Nur, which is a reflection of light. Please do not forget what he said. Munir is borrowed light, and Nur is reflected light. Not only is this claimed to be a statement in keeping with scientific truth, but it is also claimed to be scientifically miraculous, since this was supposedly only discovered relatively recently. It is correct that the moon does not emit its own light, but only reflects the light of the sun. But this was known already almost a thousand years before Muhammad. Aristotle, in about 360 BC, discussed knowing that the earth was round by its shadow on the moon. He could see earth's shadow crossing the moon if he knew that moonlight is reflected light. If you still insist that this is a miracle of scientific knowledge, then we must ask ourselves, do the Quranic words themselves support this claim? Siraj. First, we shall look at Siraj. In Surah Noah, which was read above, in Surah Al-Furqan 2561, it is simply lamp, referring to the sun. In Surah Naba 7813, Sirajan Wahjan means a dazzling lamp, again indicating the sun. The words Nur and Munir come from the same Arabic word, root. The word Munir is used six times in the Quran. Four times, Surah Al Imran 3184, Al Hajj 228, Luqman 3120, and Fatir 3535, it is the phrase Kitab al Munir, which Yusuf Ali translates as a book of enlightenment. And P Piktal uses the scripture giving light. Clearly, this indicates a book which is radiating the light of knowledge. Nothing about reflection. Nur. It says in Surah Noah 7116 and Yunus 10.5 that Allah made the light, the moon a light. Thus we find that the Quran says that the moon is a light and it never says that the moon reflects light. Moreover, in other verses, the Quran says that Allah is a nur, a light. Surah Nur 2435, one of the most beautiful passages in the Quran reads, Allah is the light nur of the heavens and the earth. The parable of his light is as if there was a niche, a niche, and within it a lamp, the lamp enclosed in glass, the glass as it were a brilliant star, and so forth. Thus we see that the word nur is used for both the moon and Allah. Are we going to say that Allah gives off reflected light? I think not. But if you continue to insist that nur used for the moon means borrowed or reflected light, and we saw above that Allah is the light nur of the heavens and the earth. What is the source of this light, Siraj, of which Allah is only a reflection? Think about it. If Allah is named nur or reflected light, who or what is the Siraj? Well, the Quran tells us who the Siraj is. But the answer will shock you. In Surah Al-Ahzab 33, 45, 46, we find, O Prophet, truly we have sent thee as a witness a bearer of glad tidings and a warner, and as a lamp spreading light. Here it says that Mohammed is the lamp spreading light. In Arabic it is wasirajan muniran. Linguistically and spiritually, this is the end of the discussion. 
Linguistically, Siraj and the adjective Munir are used together for the same shining thing, the person Muhammad. It's clear Munir does not mean reflected light in this verse or in any other verse. It means shining. The people of Muhammad's time understood that the moon was shining and they were right. Just as the people of Moses' time understood that the sun was the greater light and the moon the lesser light and they were right. But if you insist that the Arabic words Nur and Munir mean reflected light, then based on the use of these words in the Quran, Muhammad is like the sun and Allah is like the moon. Does Dr. Nike really want to say that Muhammad is the source of light and Allah is only his reflection? Why are these so-called scientific claims made which no Muslim can support if he makes a serious study of his own Quran? In a dialogue like tonight, it makes honest discussion very difficult, almost impossible. Let us go on and look at the water cycle. Some, Muslims and other author, some Muslim authors claim that the Quran shows pre-scientific knowledge of water cycle. What is the water cycle? Here in this slide, you see four steps. The first step is evaporation. The water evaporates from the seas and the earth. Second step, it becomes clouds. Third step, it gives rain. And fourth, this rain causes the plants to grow. This is all very straightforward. And everybody knows two, three, and four. Even if they live in a town, they know that clouds come and rain comes and their flowers grow. But what about step one, the evaporation? You can't see it. It's difficult. And the Quran does not have step one. Now we're going to look at a prophet from the Bible, a prophet from 700 BC, prophet Amos. And he writes, he who made the Pleiades and Orion who turns black with blackness into dawn and darkness darkest, darkens day into night, and then who calls off for the waters of the sea, stage one, and pours them out over the face of the land, stage three. The Lord Yahweh is his name. And what, one other prophet is uh, Job in 36. 2628, at least a thousand years before the Hejra, he says, how great is God beyond our understanding. The number of his years is past finding out. Stage one, he draws up the drops of water, which distill from the mist as rain. That's stage three. And then the clouds are mentioned. Stage two, stage two which pour down their moisture and abundant showers fall on mankind. So here in the Bible, this difficult stage one is there from more than a thousand years before the Quran. Now let us go on and look at mountains. The Quran has more than a dozen verses stating that God placed firm and unmovable mountains on the earth. And in some of these verses, the mountains are listed as either a blessing for believers or a warning for the unbelievers. One example of this is found in the Surah Luqman. 31, 10, 11, where the mountains are one of five warnings. It says, he, was crea he has created the heavens. It says he has created the heavens without supports that you can see. And has cast el -Ka onto the earth firm mountains, Rawasya, lest it should shake with you. In the prophets, the Lenabiya, 2131, as one of seven warnings, we read, and we have set on the earth firm mountains, lest it should shake with you, with them. Finally, in the B, Nahal 1615, says, and we, he has cast el -Ka onto the earth firm mountains, Rawasya, lest it should shake with you. We see then that the believers and unbelievers are told that Allah has done this great thing. He's thrown down and placed the mountains so that the earth will not shake violently with them. Therefore, we must ask ourselves, what did they understand? In the next two verses, another picture is given. The news, Anaba 7867. Have we not made the earth an expanse and the mountains as stakes 
El Jibala Otaidan, as those used to anchor a tent in the ground. And then the overwhelming, El Rashia, 88, 17, 19. Do they, the unbelievers, not look at the mountains, El Jibal, how they've been pitched like a tent? Here men are told that the mountains are placed as tent pegs. Tent pegs keep the tent stable. So again, the idea is put forward that the pegs, the mountains, will keep the earth from shaking. A third picture is presented in the word rawasya, used for mountains. This word comes from the Arabic root arsa, and the same root is used for the Arabic word for anchor. To throw out or cast the anchor is el ka al mirsa. So instead of cast the anchor to keep the ship from moving, we have cast the mountains to keep the earth from shaking. From these pictures, it is clear that Muhammad's followers understood that the mountains were thrown down like tent pegs to keep a tent in place, like an anchor to hold a ship in place, to stop the earth from moving, i.e. limit earthquakes. But in fact, this is false. The forming of mountains causes earthquakes. Therefore, these verses present a definite problem. Dr. Maurice Bukai recognized this and discussed them in his book, The Bible, the Koran, and Science. After quoting the above verses about mountains, he says, Modern geologists describe the folds in the earth as giving foundation to the mountains, and the stability of the earth's crust results from this phenomenon of these folds. When asked about this, Professor of Geology Dr. David A. Young says, while it is true that many mountain ranges are composed of folded rock, and the folds may be of large scale, it's not true that the folds render the crust stable. The very existence of the folds is evidence of instability in the crust. In other words, mountains don't keep the earth from shaking. Their formation caused and still causes the surface of the earth to shake. Geological theories at the present time propose that the hardened crust of the earth is made of sections or plates, which slowly move in relation to each other. Sometimes the plates separate, like North and South America separating from Europe and Asia, and Europe and South Africa. And sometimes they go together and they slide next to each other, and they bump into each other, and then they cause earthquakes. An example this time of mountain formation is found in the Middle East, where the migration of Arabia toward Iran has resulted in the Zygros range in, in Iran. In many parts of the world, as one travels along the roads, one sees a hillside where the sandstone Layers, which were horizontal when they were deposited, are now sticking up at angles. And so here you can see these sandstone layers, which were horizontal in the beginning, now they're sticking up at 75 degrees, where they, be, they were pushed up there by an earthquake, by the mountains being formed. Sometimes the plates get caught on each other and stop sliding. During this period, great forces are built up. When the forces of friction are overcome, the piece of plate that was stuck lurches forward, causing the shock wave of a thrust quake. And all of a sudden, it goes thunk like this. In a recent earthquake, it was calculated that the Cocos Plate in Mexico suddenly jumped forward three meters. Well, if your house suddenly jumped three meters, it would be a catastrophe. Another type of, mount of mountain is that formed by volcanoes. Lava and ash from inside the earth are thrown out and piled up until a high mountain is formed, even from the bottom of the sea. And we can see this kind of action in this picture. I hope you can see it. Not clear, is it? The ocean crust is right here, and the continental crust is there, and the oceanic crust is going down under the continental crust, and mountains have been formed here. Here's a volcano, and here is the magma, or the molten rock, going up through the volcano. And here's another volcano with magma going up. And so this is how the mountains are formed, and earthquakes are formed. In the case of some igneous mountains, molten rock intrudes into the throat of a volcano's opening, 
and cools form a relatively dense intrusion, which extends below the surface of the Earth. So this, if this got stuck and sealed, then it would be like a plug. However, it's not a root. It does not bear the weight of the mountain. It's really a plug. Therefore, on occasion, pressure builds up under the plug, and the volcano explodes, as happened in the South Pacific at Krakatoa in 1883, when the whole island was blown away. And it happened in Mount St. Helena in our days, when the mountain was blown away. We can conclude from this information that mountains were formed originally with movement and shaking, and that now, in the present, earthquakes are caused by their continued formation. When the plates buckle over each other, there are earthquakes. When the volcanoes erupt, there can be earthquakes. However, it is clear that the followers of Muhammad were understanding these verses to say that Allah threw the mountains down as a tent pegs or anchors to keep the earth from shaking. Throwing the mountains down into the earth may be poetry, but to say that mountains keep the earth from shaking is a severe difficulty, which is out of step with modern science. Now we're going to take a little look at what the sun says about about the Quran says about the sun. In the Surah of the Kaf, 1886, it says, until when Zul Kornain, that's Alexander the Great, reached the setting of the sun, he found it set in a spring of murky water. I'm sorry, in 20th century science, 20th century science, the sun does not set in a spring of murky water. And then in the criterion of Furqan 2545 to 46, it says, Hast thou not turned thy vision to thy Lord, how he prolongs the shadow? If he willed, he could make it stationary. Then do we, God, make the sun its guide. What about this? As the sun's, if you think of the sun overhead, you have no shadow or a little tiny shadow. And then as the sun goes down, your shadow gets longer on the other side. Well, the sun is stationary in relation to the earth. It's not what causes the shadow to shift. The rotating earth guides the shadows. So if you demand 20th century accuracy, the Sora should say the rotating earth causes the shadows to change. I will look at a different subject. Solomon's death. Whether this is science, I don't know. Maybe sociology. Solomon's dead. He's propped up on his staff. It says the jinn's work for him as Solomon desired. Then when we decreed death upon Solomon, nothing showed them his death except the little creeping creature of the earth, which gnawed away his staff. And when he fell, the jinn's came clearly, saw clearly how if they had known the unseen, they would not have continued in the humiliating penalty of work. <laughs> so here's Solomon. He's dead. He's propped up on his staff, like a wakaf in Morocco overseeing only a road gang. And no cook comes to ask him for what he wants for dinner. And no general comes for orders. And none of his nobles come to say, let's go hunting. No one notices. I'm sorry. I do not believe this story. And it won't fit fit 20th century sociology or 7th century sociology, where the king would never be left alone like that. Now finally, let us look at milk. It says in the Surah of the Bee, Anahal, 1666, we pour out to you from what is within their, cattle, in their abdomen, the cattle's abdomen, between excretions and blood, milk, pure and agreeable to the drinkers. The abdomen where the intestines are, sorry, in 20th century medical science, the abdomen where intestines are is where the intestines are. The mammary glands are under the skin. In humans, they're under the skin here. In cattle, they're under the skin between the legs. No connection. There's no connection between the breasts and the intestines and their feces in any way. Feces, though in the body, it really is outside of the animal. Animal's finished with it. It's not connected to milk or to anything else. And finally, going to look at communities. 
the surah of the cattle, Al An, Al Anam, 638. There is not an animal on the earth, nor a being that flies on two wings, but forms communities like you. Speaks about no animal on earth, not a being that flies. And then it says that every one of them is communities like you. And I assume that the Quran is speaking about we humans. Well, some fly, in some spiders, when they finish mating, the mother eats the father. Well, I'm glad that my wife didn't eat me. Even in bees, the extra male drones are thrown out to die. Well, I'm glad also that after I, we had four children that my wife didn't push me out of the house, too. Finally, the lions. When a lion gets old, a male lion gets old, a young lion comes along and drives him away from his own wives. And the young lion takes over the wives. But what he does with the cubs, the cubs of the old lion, he kills them all. So I do not think that this sentence is true. All of the communities are, and all of the animals do not live in communities like us. In conclusion, it is clear that the Koran has many scientific errors. As a generality, the Koran mirrors and reflects the science of its time, the science of the 7th century AD. We came here to seek truth. I've done my best to present valid information. If you want to see all the references, my book, The Koran and the Bible in the Light of History and Science, is for sale outside that door at a bargain price tonight. May the God of all truth guide you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Campbell, for your presentation. Now we have Brother Sabil Ahmed presenting an introduction of our next speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It is my pleasure to introduce one of the best scholars of our time, Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Nayak, age 34 years old. He is the president of Islamic Research Foundation, Bombay, India. Though a medical doctor with professional training, Dr. Zakir Naik is known as a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. Dr. Zakir Naik clarifies Islamic viewpoints and clears misconceptions about Islam based upon the Quran, Hadith, and other religious scriptures, as well as adhering to reason, logic, and scientific facts. He is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences after his public talks. In the last four years itself, Dr. Zakir Naik has delivered more than 400 public lectures worldwide, in addition to many public talks in India. He appears regularly on many international TV and satellite TV channels programs in several countries of the world. He has authored books on Islam and comparative religion. He has also participated in several symposiums and dialogues with prominent personalities of other religious faiths. May I announce, after the talks by both the speakers and the response session, we would be having an open question and answer session. So those who have come late, kindly note, we'll have questions on the mics followed by questions on index cards. Ladies and gentlemen, may I call upon Dr. Zakir Naik to present his talk. Alhamdulillah, was salatu was salam, ala rasulillah, wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain, amma abad. Auz billahi min ash-shaytani rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi, 
وفی انفسهم حتى يتبين لهم انه الحق اولم يكف بربك انه على كل شيء شهيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي ريسبكتد دكتور ويليام كامبل دكتور مراكز دكتور جمال بدوي برادر سامويل نومان دكتور محمد نايك ماي ريسبكتد ايلدرز اند ماي ديير برادرز اند سيسترز اي ويلكم اول اوف يو وذ ذا اسلامي جريتينجز السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. The topic of today's dialogue is the Quran and the Bible in the light of science. The glorious Quran is the last and final revelation which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For any book to claim that it is a revelation from almighty god it should stand the test of time previously in the olden days it was the age of miracles alhamdulillah the quran is the miracle of miracles later on came the age of literature and poetry and muslims and non muslims alike they claim the glorious quran to be the best arabic literature available on the face of the earth but today is the age of science and technology let us analyze whether the quran is compatible or incompatible with modern science albert einstein said science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind let me remind you that the glorious quran is not a book of signs s c i e n c e it's a book of signs s i g n s it's a book of ayats and there are more than 6000 signs ayats in the glorious quran out of which more than 1000 speak about signs as far as my talk regarding quran and signs is concerned i will only be speaking about scientific facts which have been established i will not be speaking about scientific hypotheses and theories which are based on assumption without any proof because we all know many a times science takes u turns dr william campbell who wrote a reply to the book of dr morris bukel the quran the bible in the light of history and science he says in his book that there are two types of approaches one is a concordance approach which means a person tries to bring a compatibility between the scripture and science and the other is the conflict approach in which a person tries to bring a conflict between scripture and science like how dr william campbell has done very well but as far as the quran is concerned irrespective whether a person uses a conflicting approach or a concordance approach as long as you are logical and after a logical explanation is given to you not a single person will be able to prove a single verse of the quran in conflict with established modern science <laughs> dr william campbell has pointed out various alleged scientific errors in the quran and i'm supposed to actually refute in the rebuttal but since he chose to speak first i will be refuting a few points in my talk i will reply to the major part of his talk mainly dealing with embryology and with geology the remaining inshallah inshallah i will try a level best to reply in the rebuttal i have to do both i can't do injustice the topic the topic is quran and bible in the light of science i can't only speak about one scripture dr william campbell hardly spoke about one or two points about the bible which i shall deal with inshallah i will speak about both inshallah i want to do justice to the topic as far as quran and modern science is concerned in the field of astronomy the scientists the astronomers a few decades earlier they described 
how the universe came into existence. They call it the Big Bang. And they said initially, there was one primary nebula, which later on, it separated with the Big Bang, which gave rise to galaxies, stars, sun, and the earth we live in. This information is given in a nutshell in the glorious Quran in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 30, which says, Awalam yara lazina kafru. Do not the unbelievers see anna samawati wal arda kanat ratkum saknahuma that the heaven and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. Imagine this information which they came to know recently, the Quran mentions 1400 years ago. When I was in school, I had learned that the sun, in respect to the earth, it was stationary. The earth and the moon, they rotated about the axis, but the sun was stationary. But when I read a verse of the Quran saying, in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 33, it says, Huwa lazi khalaqa layl wa nahara. It is Allah who has created the night and the day. Wa shams wa kamar, the sun and the moon. Kullun fi falaki yasbahoon. Each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. Now, alhamdulillah, modern science has confirmed the Quranic statement. The Arabic word used in the Quran is yasbahun, which describes the motion of a moving body. When it refers to a celestial body, it means it is rotating about its own axis. So Quran says the sun and the moon, they revolve as well as rotate about their own axis. Today we have come to know that the sun takes approximately 25 days to complete one rotation. It was Edwin Hubble who discovered that the universe is expanding. The Quran says in Surah Dhariyat, chapter 51, verse number 47, that we have created the expanding universe, the vastness of space. The Arabic word Mosiona refers to vastness, the expanding universe. Regarding the topics on astronomy which Dr. William Campbell touched, I will deal in the rebuttal, inshallah. In the field of water cycle, Dr. William Campbell pointed out certain things. The Quran describes the water cycle in great detail. And Dr. William Campbell mentioned four stages. In his book, he mentions four A and B. The last one he didn't mention in the slide, I don't know why. It says that replenishing the water table, he missed out here, maybe because it's not mentioned in the Bible. He said there is not a single verse in the Quran which speaks about evaporation. Quran says in Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 11, Rajas Sama, that by the capacity of the heavens to return. And almost all the commentators of the Quran, they said that this verse of Surah Tariq, chapter 86, verse number 11, refers to the capacity of the heaven to return back rain, meaning evaporation. Dr. William Campbell, who knows Arabic, may say, why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically mention was Samai Zatil Matar, meaning the capacity of the heaven to return back rain? Why didn't Allah mention specifically? Now we have come to know why didn't Allah do that in his divine wisdom. Because today we have come to know that besides the ozonosphere, the layer above the earth, besides returning back rain, it even returns back other beneficial matter and energy of the earth which is required by the human being. It does not only return back rain, today we have come to know it even returns back waves of telecommunication, of television of radio by which we can see TV, we can communicate, we can hear the radio. And besides that, it even returns back the harmful rays of the outer space back on the other side and absorbs. For example, the sunlight, the ultraviolet rays of the sunlight is absorbed by the ionosphere. If this was not done, life on the earth would have ceased to exist. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far superior and far more accurate when it says, Raja Sama, by the capacity of the heaven to return. And the remaining thing, as he mentioned, is there in the Quran. You can refer to my video cassette. The Quran described the water cycle in great detail. Regarding what he said about the Bible, he showed stage one and stage three in the first slide. And the second, stage one, three, and then two. That the rainwater is taken up, he says, and then the rainwater comes down on the earth. This is the philosophy of phase of Miletus in 7th century BC. He thought that the spray of the ocean was picked up by the wind and fell into the interior as rain. There's no cloud mentioned there. 
In the second quotation Dr. William Campbell gave, first is according to him evaporation, which we agree, we don't mind having the concordance approach to the Bible. Then rain falls down, and then other clouds formed. That is not the complete water cycle. Alhamdulillah, the Quran describes the water cycle in great detail, in several places. How does the water rise, evaporates, form into clouds, the clouds join together, they stack up, there's thunder and lightning, water comes down, the clouds move into the interior, they fall down as rain, and the replenishing of the water table, and alhamdulillah, in great detail. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail in several places. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse 48. In Surah Azumar, chapter 39, verse 21. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 18. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. In Surah Al-Hijr, chapter 15, verse number 22. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 57. In Surah Roy, chapter number 13, verse number 17. In Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 40 and 49. In Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 9. In Surah Yasin, chapter 36, verse number 34. In Surah Jasha, chapter 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 9. In Surah Waqa, chapter number 56, verse number 16 and 17. In several places, Surah Mulk, chapter 67, verse number 30, the glorious Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. <laughs> Dr. William Campbell spent maximum time on embryology, about half his talk, quite a lot on geology and touched on other six topics. I've noted down. In the field of geology we have come to know today, the geologists tell us that the radius of the Earth is approximately 3,750 miles. And the deeper layers, they are hot and fluid and cannot sustain life. And the superficial part of the Earth's crust which we live on, it is very thin. Hardly 1 to 30 miles. Some portions are thicker, but majority 1 to 30 miles. And there are high possibility that this superficial layer, the Earth's crust, it will shake. It is due to the folding phenomena, which gives rise to mountain ranges, which gives stability to this Earth. And Quran says in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and 7, we have made the Earth as an expanse, while Jabala Autada and the mountains as sticks. The Quran doesn't say mountains were thrown up as sticks. Mountains as sticks. Arabic word Autad means sticks, meaning tent peg. And today we have come to know, in the study of modern geology, that mountain has got deep roots. This was known in the second half of the 19th century. And the superficial part that we see of the mountain is a very small percentage. The deeper part is within. Exactly like a stake, how it is driven in the ground. You can only see a small part on top, the majority is down in the ground. Or like a tip of the iceberg, you can see the tip on the top, and about 90% is beneath water. The Quran says, in Surah Ghashia, chapter 88, verse number 19, and Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 32. Wal Jibala Arsaha, and we have made the mountain standing firm on the earth. Made the mountain standing firm on the earth. Today, after modern geology has advanced, and Dr. William Campbell said that, by the theory of plate tectonics, it was propounded in 1960, which gives rise to mountain ranges, the geologists today do say that the mountains give stability to the earth. Not all geologists, but many do say. I have not come across a single geological book, and I challenge Dr. William Campbell to produce a single geological book, not his personal correspondence with the geologist. That doesn't carry weight. His personal correspondence with Dr. Keith Moore, documented proof. And if you read the book, The Earth, which is referred by almost all the universities in the field of geology, one of its authors by the name of Dr. Frank Press, who was the advisor to the former president of USA, Jimmy Carter, and was the president of the Academy of Sciences of USA. He writes in his book that the mountains are west shaped, it has deep roots within, and he says that the function of the mountain is to stabilize the earth. And the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, 
verse number 31. In Surah Luqman chapter 31, verse number 10, as well as in Surah Nahal chapter number 16, verse number 15, that we have made the mountain standing firm on the earth, lest it would shake with them and with you. The function of the mountain in the Quran is given to prevent the earth from shaking. Nowhere does the Quran say that the mountain prevents the earthquake. And Dr. William Campbell said, he writes in his book and even the talk, that you find in the mountainous regions there are various earthquakes and mountains cause earthquake. Point to be noted, nowhere does the Quran say that mountain prevents earthquake. The Arabic word for earthquake, as Dr. William Campbell knows Arabic, is zilzal or zalzala. But the words used in these three verses I quoted, it is tamida. Tamida means to shake, to sway, to swing. And Quran says in Surah Luqman chapter 31 verse number 10, as well as Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse 15, we have put on the earth mountain standing firm, lest it would shake with you. It is tamida bikum, shake with you, indicating if the mountain were not there, if you would have walked, if you would have moved, even the earth would have moved with you. If you would have swayed, even the earth would have swayed with you. And we know normally when we walk on the earth, the earth doesn't shake. And the reason for this is, according to Dr. Frank Pess and Dr. Najjar, who's from Saudi Arabia, and he wrote a full book on geological concepts in the Quran, answering almost everything what Dr. William Campbell has said in detail. And Dr. William Campbell, in his book, he writes that if mountains prevent the shaking of the earth, then how come you find earthquake in the mountainous regions? I said, nowhere does the Quran say mountain prevents earthquake. Earthquake is result. And if you see the definition in the Oxford Dictionary, it says, earthquake is due to convulsion of the superficial crust of the earth due to release of compressed seismic waves due to crack in the rock or due to volcanic reaction. Quran speaks about Zalzala in Surah Zalzal chapter 99, but here it speaks about Tamida Bikum, to prevent the earth from shaking with you. And in reply to the statement that if mountains prevent earthquakes, how come you find earthquakes in mountainous region? The reply is that if I say that medical doctors, they prevent the sickness and disease in a human being, and if someone argues, if doctors prevent the sickness and diseases in a human being, how come you find more sick people in the hospital where there are doctors than at home where there are no doctors? In the field of oceanology, the glorious Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 53, that it is Allah who has let free two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and palatable, the other salt and bitter. Though they meet, they do not mix. Between them, there is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Quran says in Surah Rahman, chapter 55, verse number 19 and 20, Marajal al gyan. It is Allah who has let free two bodies of flowing water. Though they meet, they do not mix. Between them, there is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Previously, the commentators of the Quran wondered, what does the Quran mean? We know about sweet and salt water, but between them, there is a barrier. Though they meet, they do not mix. Today, after advancement of oceanology, we have come to know that whenever one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. There is a slanting, homogenizing area which the Quran refers to as barzakh, unseen barrier. And this has been agreed upon by several scientists, even of America, by the name of Dr. Hay. He's oceanologist. And Dr. William Campbell writes in his book that it is an observable phenomena. The fishermen of that time knew there were two types of water, salt and sweet. So Prophet Muhammad, during the expedition to Syria, he may have gone in the sea, or he might have spoken to these fishermen. Sweet and salt water is an observable phenomena, I agree. But people did not know that there was an unseen barrier until recently. The scientific point to be noted here is the barzakh, not the sweet and the salt water. In the field of embryology, Dr. William Campbell spent approximately half of his talk on that. Time will not permit me to reply to every small thing which are illogical. I'll just give a brief reply, which will be satisfactory, inshallah. And for more details, you can refer to my video cassette, Quran Modern Science, and my other cassettes on Quran and Medical Science. There were a group of Arabs 
who collected the data dealing in the Quran about embryology and the hadith dealing with embryology, and they presented it to Professor Kitmu, who was the chairman and the head of the department of anatomy in the University of Toronto in Canada. And at present, he's one of the leading scientists in the field of embryology. After reading the various translations of the Quran, he was asked to comment and he said, most of the verses of the Quran and the Hadith are in perfect conformity with modern embryology. But there are a few verses which I cannot say that they are right. Neither can I say that they are wrong because I myself don't know about it. And two such verses were the first verse of the Quran to be revealed from Surah Ikra or Surah Alak, chapter 96, verse number 1 and 2, which says, Ikra bismi rabbika allazi khalaq. Khalaq al insana min alaq. Read, recite, or proclaim in the name of thy Lord, who created, who created the human beings from something which clings a leech-like substance. Regarding Dr. William Campbell's statement that to analyze the meaning of a word, you have to see what was the meaning at that time when it was revealed, at that time when the book was written. And he rightly said that to analyze the meaning, you have to analyze the meaning at the time it was revealed and to the people who it was meant for. As far as this statement of his is concerned, regarding the Bible, I do agree with it totally because the Bible was only meant for the children of Israel for that time. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 and 6. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, tells his disciples, go ye not in the way of the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? The non-Jews, the Hindus, the Muslims. But rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus Christ and the Bible were only meant for the children of Israel. Since it was meant for them to analyze the Bible, you have to use the meaning of the word which was utilized at that time. But the Quran was not meant only for the Arabs of that time. Quran is not meant only for the Muslims. The Quran is meant for the whole of humanity. And it is meant to be for eternity. Quran says in Surah Ibrahim chapter 14 verse 52, in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse 185, and Surah Zumar chapter 39 verse 41, that the Quran is meant for the whole of humankind. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Ambiya chapter number 21, verse number 107, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee as a mercy, as a guidance to the whole of humankind. So as far as the Quran is concerned, you cannot limit the meaning only for that time because it is meant for eternity. So one of the meanings of alaka is leech-like substance or something which clings. So Professor Keith Moore said, I do not know whether the early stage of embryo looks like a leech. And he went in his laboratory and he analyzed the early stage of an embryo under a microscope and compared it with a photograph of a leech and he was astonished at the striking resemblance. This is the photograph of a leech and human embryo. What Dr. William Campbell showed you is the other perspective of it. If I show this book, it looks like a rectangle. If I show you like that, it's a different perspective. <laughs> that diagram is given in the book. The diagram you show on the slide is given there, and I'll deal with it, inshallah. Professor Keith Moore, after about 80 questions were asked to him, he said, if you would have asked me these 80 questions 30 years ago, I would not be able to answer more than 50% because embryology has developed recently in the past 30 years. He said this in the 80s. Now, do we believe in Dr. Keith Moore, whose statement is available outside in the foyer, if video cassettes are available, this is the truth, unknown, recorded statement. So will you believe Dr. William Campbell's personal conversation with Professor Keith Moore? Or the one mentioned in this book with Islamic edition, as well as the photograph that I've shown to you. And in the video cassette available outside, you can see it. He makes those statements. So 
you have to choose which is more logical, personal discussion with Dr. William Campbell or his statement on video, like how Dr. William Campbell showed my video. 100% proof what I said. Moon is reflected light, I'll come to it later on. <laughs> and whatever additional information you got from Quran and Hadith, it was incorporated later into this book, The Developing Human, the third edition. And this book got an award for the best medical book written by a single author in that year. This is the Islamic edition that was put forward by Sheikh Abdul Majid Zindani and certified by Keith Moore himself. The Quran says in Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 13, and Surah Hajj, chapter 22, verse number 5, and no less than 11 different places in the Quran that the human beings have been made from anutfa, a minute quantity of liquid. Like a trickle that's remaining in the cup, anutfa in Arabic, a very small quantity. Today we have come to know in one seminal emission in which there are several millions of sperm, only one is required to fertilize the ovum, the Quran refers as nutfa. Quran says in Surah Sajda chapter 32 verse number 8, we have created the human beings from solala, that means the best part of a whole. The one sperm which fertilizes the ova, out of the millions of sperm, the Quran refers to as sulala, best part of the whole. And Quran says in Surah Insan, chapter 76, verse number 2, we have created the human beings from Nutfat and Amshaj, a minute quantity of mingled fluid, referring to the sperm as well as the ovum. Both are required for the fertilization. The Quran describes the various embryological stages in great detail, of which the slide was shown to you by Dr. William Campbell. He helped me to complete this topic. It's mentioned Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 12 to 14. The translation is that we have created the human beings from anutfa, a minute quantity of liquid, then placed it in Akrar Makin, a place of security. Then we made it into an alaka, a leech-like substance, something which clings, a congealed clot of blood. Then we made that alaka into a mudga, a chewed-like lump. Then we made the mudga into idama, bones. Then clothed the bones with lamb, flesh. Then we made it a new creature. Blessed be Allah, who's the best to create. These three verses of the Quran speak about the various embryologic stages in great detail. First the nutfa, placed in a place of security, made into an alaka. Alaka has got three meanings. One is something which clings, and we know that in the initial stages, the embryo clings to the uterine wall and continues clinging till the end. Point number two, that it also means a leech-like substance. And as I discussed earlier, the embryo in the initial stages does look like a leech. Besides looking like a leech, it also behaves like a leech. It receives its blood supply from the mother, like a blood sucker. And the third meaning, which Dr. William Campbell objected to, that that is the right meaning, the congealed clot of blood, and that's why Quran has a scientific error. And I do agree with him that Dr. William Campbell didn't agree. He said, how can it mean a congealed clot of blood? Because this is the case and the Quran is wrong. I'm sorry to say, Quran is not wrong. Dr. William Campbell, with due respect to him, he's wrong. Because today, today, after advancement of embryology, even Dr. Keith Moore, he says that in the initial stages, the embryo, besides looking like a leech, also looks like a congealed clot of blood. Because in the initial stages of the stage of Alaka, three to four weeks, the blood is clotted within closed vessels. And Dr. William Campbell made it easy for me. He showed you a slide. It will be difficult for you to see, but this is the slide he showed you. This is exactly what Professor Keith Moore said looks like a clot, in which the blood is clotted within closed vessels. And during the third week of the embryo, the blood circulation doesn't take place, it starts later on. Therefore, it assumes the appearance of a clot. And even if you observe the conceptus, that's after abortion takes place, you can see 
it looks like a clot. Only one line answer is sufficient to answer all the allegations of Dr. William Campbell is that the stages of the Quran, while it describes the embryologic stages, is only based on appearance. Appearance. First is the appearance of a alaka, a leech-like substance, as well as a clot of blood. And Dr. William Campbell rightly said that some ladies come and ask, please remove the clot. It does look like a clot. And the stages are based on appearance. It is created from something which appears like a clot, which appears like a leech, and is also something which clings. Then the Quran says, we made that alaka into a mudga, a chewed like lump. Prophet Keith Moore took plaster seal and bit between his teeth to make it look like a mudga. The teeth mark resembled the somites. Dr. William Campbell said, when the alaka becomes a mudga, the clinging is yet there. It is dead late and half months. So, the Quran is wrong. I told you in the beginning, the Quran is describing the appearance. The leech-like appearance and the clot-like appearance is changed to the chewed-like appearance. It yet continues to cling till the end. There's no problem. But the stages are divided on appearance, not on the function. Later on, Quran says, we made the mudga into izama bones. Then clothed the bones with flesh. Sir William Campbell said, and I do agree with him, that the precursors of the muscles and the cartilages, that is the bones, they form together. I agree with that. Today, embryology tells us that the primordia of the muscles and the bones, they form together between the 25th and the 40th day, which the Quran refers to as the stage of mudga. But they are not developed. They are not developed. Later on, at the end of the seventh week, the embryo takes form of human appearance. Then the bones are formed. Today, modern embryology says the bones are formed after the 42nd day. And it gives an appearance of a skeletal thing. Even at this stage, when the bones are formed, the muscles aren't formed. Later on, after the seventh week and the starting of eighth week, are the muscles formed. So Quran is perfect in describing first alaka, then mudga, then izaman, then clothed with flesh. And when they form, the description is perfect. And Professor Keith Moore said that the stages that how it is described in modern embryology, stage one, two, three, four, five, it's so confusing. The Quranic stage on embryology describing on the base of appearance and the shape is far more superior. Alhamdulillah. Therefore he said, Therefore, he said that I have no objection in accepting that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God and that this glorious Quran has to be a divine revelation from Almighty God. It's mentioned in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse 56. It speaks about pain. Previously, the doctors, they thought that the brain was only responsible for feeling of pain. Today we have come to know, besides the brain, there are certain receptors in the skin which are responsible for feeling of the pain, which we call as pain receptors. Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, 56, that as to those who reject our signs, we shall cast them into the hellfire, and as often as their skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain. Indicating there is something in the skin. Professor Takla Takashan, who is the head of the Department of Anatomy in Chiang Mai University in Thailand, only on the basis of this one verse, he proclaimed the Shahada in the 8th Medical Conference in Riyadh and said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, that there's no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the Messenger of Allah. I started my talk by quoting the verse of the Glorious Quran from Surah Fusila, chapter 41, verse 53, which says, Sanurihim ayatina fil afaki, but fi anfusihim, hatta yatabayyina lawm annawlaq, awalam yakfi bi rabbika, annawlaq ulle shayin shaheed, that soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest region of the horizons and into their soul until it is clear to them that this is the truth. This one verse was sufficient to prove to Dr. Takra Takashan that Quran is a divine revelation. Some may require 10 signs. Some may require 100. Some, even after a 1,000 signs are given, they will not accept the truth. Quran calls such people as 
in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 18 summum bukmun umyun fahum la yarjun the deaf the dumb the blind they will not return the true path the bible says the same thing in gospel of matthew chapter number 13 verse number 13 seeing they see not hearing they hear not neither will they understand and regarding the other parts of embryology i will deal in my rebuttal inshallah if time permits i have to do justice to the other part also regarding bible and the right of science at the outset let me tell you that quran says in surah raj chapter 13 verse 38 that we have given several revelations by name only four are mentioned the torah the zabur the injil and the quran the torah is the wahi the revelation which was given to moses peace be upon him the zabur is the wahi which was given to david peace be upon him the Injil is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Quran is the last and final revelation which was given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Let me make it very clear to everyone that this Bible, which the Christian believe to be the word of God, is not the Injil which we Muslims believe was revealed to Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. This Bible, according to us, it may contain the words of God, but it also contains words of prophets, words of historians. It contains absurdities, obscenity, as well as innumerable scientific errors. If there are scientific points mentioned in the Bible, there are possibilities. Why not? It may be part of the word of God in the Bible, but what about the scientific errors? What about the unscientific portion? Can you attribute this to God? I want to make it very clear to my Christian brothers and sisters. The purpose of my presentation on Bible and science is not to hurt any Christian's feeling. If while presenting, if I hurt your feelings, I do apologize in advance. The purpose is only to point out that a God's revelation cannot contain scientific errors. As Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, search ye the truth, and the truth shall free you. You have the Old Testament, you have the New Testament. Now you should follow the last and final testament, which is the glorious Quran. As far as Dr. William Campbell is concerned, I can be more liberal with him, because he has written a book, Quran, Bible, in the light of history and science. He has given a presentation, and he's a medical doctor, I don't have to be very formal with him. As far as the other Christian brothers and sisters are concerned, I apologize if I hurt your feelings during the presentation. Let's analyze what does the Bible say about modern science. First, we deal with astronomy. The Bible speaks about the creation of the universe. In the beginning, first book, book of Genesis, first chapter, it's mentioned. It says, Almighty God created the heavens and the earth in six days and talks about an evening and a morning, referring to a 24-hour day. Today, scientists tell us that the universe cannot be created in a 24-hour period of six days. Quran 2 speaks about six ayams. The Arabic word singular is yom, plural is ayam. It can either mean a day of 24 hours or it is a very long period, an eon, an epoch. Scientists say we have no objection in agreeing that the universe, it could have been created in six very long periods. Point number two, Bible says in Genesis chapter number one, verse three and five, light was created on first day. Genesis chapter one, verse 14 to 19, the cause of light, stars, and the sun, etc., was created on fourth day. How can the cause of light be created on the fourth day later than the light which came into existence on the first day is unscientific. Further, the Bible says, Genesis chapter 1, verse 9 to 13, earth was created on the third day. How can you have a night and day without the earth? The day depends upon the rotation of the earth. Without the earth created, how can you have a night and day? Point number four. Genesis chapter number 1, verse 9 to 13 says, Earth was created on third day. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 to 19 says, the sun and the moon was created on the fourth day. Today, 
science tells us that Earth is part of the parent body, the sun. It cannot come into existence before the sun. It's unscientific. Point number five. The Bible says in Genesis chapter number one, verse number 11 to 13, the vegetation, the herbs, the shrubs, the trees, they were created on the third day. And the sun, Genesis chapter number one, verse 14 to 19, was created on the fourth day. How can the vegetation come into existence without sunlight? And how can they survive without sunlight? Point number six, point number six, that the Bible says in Genesis chapter one, verse number 16, that God created two lights. The greater light, the sun, to rule the day, and the lesser light, the moon, to rule the night. The actual translation, if you go to the Hebrew text, it is lamps, lamps, having light of its own. And that you'll come to know better if you read both the verses, Genesis chapter one, verse 16 as well as 17. Verse number 17 says, and Almighty God placed them in the firmament to give light to the earth. To give light to the earth, indicating that sun and the moon have its own light, which is in contradiction with established scientific knowledge that we have. There are certain people who try and reconciliate and say that the six days mentioned in the Bible, it actually refers to epochs, like the Quran, long period, not 624 days. It's illogical, you read the Bible, evening, morning, it clearly states 24 hours, it indicates, but even if I use a concordance approach, no problem. I agree with your illogical argument, yet they will only be able to solve the first scientific error of six days creation, and second, that first day light and third day earth. The remaining four, yet they cannot solve. Some further say, that if it's a 24 period, why can't the vegetables survive for one 24 day without sunlight? I say, fine. If you say that the vegetables were created before the sun and can survive for one 24 day, I've got no objection. But you can't say the days mentioned are 24 hours as well as epochs. You can't have the cake and eat it both. If you say it is a long period, you solve point number one and three. The remaining four are yet there. If you say the days are 24 days, you solve only point number five. The remaining five are yet there. It becomes unscientific. I leave it to Dr. William Campbell, whether he wants to say it is long period and say that there are only four scientific errors or say it is a 24 days and say there are only five scientific errors in the creation of the universe. Regarding the concept of Earth, there are various scientists who have described how will the world end, hypothesis. Some may be right, some may be wrong. But either the world will perish or the world will live forever. Both cannot take place simultaneously. It's unscientific. But this is exactly what the Bible says. It's mentioned in the Bible. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number one, verse number 10 and 11, and in the book of Psalms, chapter number 102, verse number 25 and 26, that Almighty God created the heavens and the earth and they will perish. Exactly opposite is mentioned in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter number one, verse number four, and the book of Psalms, chapter number 78, verse number 69, that the earth will abide forever. I leave it to Dr. William Campbell to choose which of the two verses are unscientific, the first pair or the second pair. One has to be unscientific, both cannot take place. The world cannot abide forever as well as perish. It's unscientific. Regarding the heavens, the Bible says in Job chapter 26, verse 11, that the pillars of the heaven will tremble. Quran says in Surah Luqman chapter 31, verse number 10, that the heavens are without any pillars. Don't you see it? Don't you see the heavens are without any pillars? Bible says heaven has got pillars. Not only do the heavens have got pillars, Bible says in the first book of Samuel, chapter number two, verse number eight, as well as the book of Job, chapter number nine, verse number six, and the book of Psalms, chapter number 75, verse number three, that even the earth have got pillars. In the field of diet and nutrition, let's analyze what does the Bible say. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, chapter number one, verse number 29, that God has given you all the herbs bearing seeds, the trees bearing fruits, those that bear seed, as meat for you. New International Version says, the seed bearing plant and 
the trees bearing fruits, bearing seeds, are food for you. All of them. Today, even a layman knows that there are several poisonous plants like wild berries, strychnine, datura, plants containing alkaloid, oleander, buckeipoid, that which if you ingest, if you eat, there are high possibilities you may die. How come the creator of the universe and human beings doesn't know that if you have these plants, you will die? I hope Dr. William Campbell doesn't give this vegetarian diet to his patients. The Bible has a scientific test how to identify a true believer. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 16, verse number 17 and 18. It says that there will be signs for true believers, and among the signs, in my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak foreign tongues, new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink deadly poison, they shall not be harmed. And when they place their hand over the sick, they shall be cured. This is a scientific test. In scientific terminology, it's known as the confirmatory test for a true Christian believer. In the past 10 years of my life, I have personally interacted with thousands of Christians, including missionary. I have not come across a single Christian who has passed this confirmatory test of the Bible. I have not come across a single Christian who took poison. I have not come across any who took poison and who has not died. And in scientific terminology, this is also called as a falsification test. That means if a false person tries and does this test, takes poison, he will die. And a false person will not dare attend this test. If you are not a true Christian believer, you will not dare attend this test. Because if you try and attempt the falsification test, you will fail. So a person who is not a true Christian believer will never attempt this test. I have read the book, the Quran, the Bible in the light of history and science, written by Dr. William Campbell. And I assume that he is a true Christian believer. And at least I would like <laughs> him to confirm to me about the falsification test. Please be rest assured. Please be rest assured. I will not ask Dr. William Campbell to have deadly poison because I don't want to jeopardize the debate. <laughs> what I'll do, I will only ask him to speak in foreign tongues, in new languages. And as many of you may be aware, that India is a land which has more than 1,000 languages and dialects. Only thing I request him is to say these three words, 100 rupees, in the 17 official languages. There are only 17 official languages in India. And to make it easier for Dr. William Campbell, I've got a 100 rupee note. And this has all the 17 languages mentioned here. Besides English and Hindi, I will help him. I'll give him a beginning. Ek so rupya in Hindi. <laughs> the remaining 15 languages are here. I request him to read. I know the test says they will speak foreign languages on their own without help of reading. But I want to make the test easier. I want to see someone passing the test. I have not seen anyone. <laughs> so if he can't say it on his own or from his memory, at least read it. I don't mind. I will accept it. And I request the chairperson to give it to Dr. William Campbell. <laughs> he has his rebuttal. 15 languages, ek so rupiah, three words only. What does the Bible say regarding hydrology? Bible says in Genesis, chapter number nine, verse number 13 to 17, that after God, at the time of Noah, submerged the world by flood, and after the flood subsided, he said, I put up a rainbow in the sky as a promise to the humankind never to submerge the world again by water. To the unscientific person, it may be quite good. Oh, rainbow is a sign of Almighty God, never to submerge the world by flood again. But today we know very well that rainbow is due to the refraction of sunlight with rain or mist. 
Surely there may have been thousands of rainbows before the time of Noah, peace be upon him. To say it was not there before Noah's time, we have to assume that the law of refraction did not exist, which is unscientific. In the field of medicine, the Bible says in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 14, verse number 14 and 53, it gives a novel way for disinfecting a house from plague of leprosy. Disinfecting a house from plague of leprosy. It says that take two birds, kill one bird, take wood, scarlet, hyssop, and the other living bird, dip it in water, and under running water, later on, sprinkle the house seven times with it. Sprinkle the house with blood to disinfect against plague of leprosy? We know blood is a good media of germ, bacteria, as well as toxin. I hope Dr. William Campbell doesn't use this method of disinfecting the OT, the operation theater. It's mentioned in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 12, verse number 1 to 5. And we know medically that after a mother gives birth to a child, the postpartum period, it is unhygienic. To say it's unclean religiously, I've got no objection. But Leviticus chapter number 12, verse number 1 to 5 says that after a woman gives birth to a male child, she will be unclean for seven days. And the period of uncleanliness will continue for 33 days more. If she gives birth to a female child, she'll be unclean for two weeks, and the period of uncleanliness will continue for 66 days. In short, if a woman gives birth to a male child, a son, she is unclean for 40 days. If she gives birth to a female child, a daughter, she's unclean for 80 days. I would like Dr. William Campbell to explain to me scientifically how come a woman remain unclean for double the period if she gives birth to a female child as compared to a male child. <laughs> the Bible also has a very good test for adultery. How to come to know a woman has committed adultery? In book of Numbers, chapter number 5, verse number 11 to 31. I'll just say in brief, it says that the priest should take holy water in a vessel, take dust from the floor and put it into the vessel. And that's the bitter water. And after cursing it, give it to the woman. And if the woman has committed adultery, after she drinks it, the curse will enter her body, the stomach will swell, the thigh will rot, and she shall be cursed by the people. If the woman has not committed adultery, she will remain clean and she will bear the seed. A novel method of identifying whether a woman has committed adultery or not. You know, today in the world, there are thousands of cases pending in different parts of the world, in different courts of law, only on the assumption that someone has alleged that the woman has committed adultery. I had read in the newspapers, and I came to know from the media that the president of this great country, Mr. Bill Clinton, he was involved in a sex scandal about two years back. I wonder that why didn't the American court use this bitter water test for adultery? He would have gone scot-free immediately. <laughs> why didn't the Christian missionaries of this great country, especially those who are in the medical field, like my respected Dr. William Campbell, use this bitter water test to bail out their president immediately? Mathematics is a branch which is closely associated with science, with which you can solve problems, etc. There are thousands of contradictions in the Bible. Hundreds deal with mathematics. I'll just touch on a few of them. It's mentioned in Ezra chapter number 2, verse number 1. And Nehemiah chapter number 7, verse number 6, the context, that when the people returned from exile from Babylon, when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, when he released the men from Israel, they came back from captivity, and the list of the people are given. The list is given in Ezra, chapter number 2, verse number 2 to 63, and Nehemiah chapter number 7, verse number 7 up to 65. The list is given with the names as well as number of people released. In these 60 verses, there are no less than 18 times the name is exactly the same, but the number is different. There are no less than 18 contradictions in less than 60 verses of these two chapters.
This is the list. I don't have time to run through the list. There are no less than 18 different contradictions in less than 60 verses. Further, it's mentioned in Ezra, chapter number 2, verse number 64, that the total congregation, if you add up, if you add up, it comes to 42,360. And if you read in Nehemiah, chapter number 7, verse number 66, they also the total is the same, 42,360. But if you add up all these verses, which I had to do my homework, this is a list. This is a list of Ezra. This is a list of Nehemiah. Ezra chapter number 2, Nehemiah chapter number 7. If you add up, I had to do my homework. If you add up, in Ezra chapter number 2, it doesn't come to 42,360. It comes to 29,818. And if you add up, Nehemiah chapter number 7, even there, it doesn't come to 42,360. It comes to 31,089. <laughs> the author of the Bible, presumed to be almighty God, does not know simple addition. If you give this problem even to a person who's passed elementary school, he'll be able to get the right answer. If you add up all the 60 verses, it's so easy. Almighty God didn't know adding knows Billa if we presume that this is the word of God. Further, if we read in Ezra chapter number 2, verse number 65, it says there were 200 singing men and women. Nehemiah chapter number 7, verse 67, there were 245 singing men and women. Were they 200 or were they 245 singing men and women? Context is the same, a mathematical contradiction. It's mentioned in the second Kings, chapter number 24, verse number 8, that Joachim was 18 years old when he began to reign Jerusalem. And he reigned for three months and 10 days. Second Chronicles, chapter number 36, verse number 9 says that Joachim was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for three months, 10 days. Was Joachim 18 years when he began to reign, or was he eight years old? Did he reign for three months, or did he reign for three months, 10 days? Further, it's mentioned in the first Kings, chapter number seven, verse number 26, that in Solomon's temple, in his molten sea, he had 2,000 baths. In second Chronicles, chapter number four, verse number five, he had 3,000 baths. Did he have 2,000 baths, or did he have 3,000 baths? That I leave it upon Dr. William Campbell to decide, which is correct. There is a clear-cut mathematical contradiction. Furthermore, it's mentioned in the first Kings, chapter number 15, verse number 33, that Basha, he died in the 26th year of reign of Asa. And second Chronicles, chapter number 16, verse number one says that Basha invaded Judah in the 36th year of the reign of Asa. How can Basha invade 10 years after his death? It's unscientific. To make it easier for Dr. William Campbell to answer to the points I have raised, I'll just mention it in brief, the points that I mentioned. The first point was that the creation of the earth and the heaven, the universe was in 624 days. Light was there before the source of light, point number two. Three, day came into existence before creation of earth, point number four. Earth came into existence before sun. Point number five, vegetation came into existence before sunlight. Point number six, light of the moon is its own light. Point number seven, the earth, will it perish or will it abide forever? Point number eight, the earth has got pillars. Point number nine, the heavens have got pillars. Point number 10, God said you can have all plants and all vegetation, including the poisonous plants. Point number 11, the scientific test, the falsification test of Mark chapter number 16, verse number 17 and 18. Point number 12, a woman remains unclean for double the period if she gives birth to a daughter as compared to a son. 
point number 13. Using blood to disinfect the house against plague of leprosy. Point number 14. How do you find out the bitter water test for adultery? Point number 15. 18 different contradictions in less than 60 verses of Ezra chapter 2 and Nehemiah chapter number 7. I didn't count them as 18 different. I've counted them only as one. Point number 16. The total is different in both the chapters. Point number 17. Are there 200 singing men and women, or are there 245 singing men and women? Point number 18. Was Joachim 18 years old, or was he 8 years old when he began to reign? Point number 19. Did he reign for 3 months, or 3 months, 10 days? Point number 20. Did Solomon have 3,000 baths, or 2,000 baths? Point number 21 is that Basha, how could he invade Judah 10 years after his death? Point number 22 is Almighty God. He said, I put up a rainbow in the sky as a promise to the humankind never to submerge the world again by water. I have listed only 22 out of the hundreds available and scientific points in the Bible, scientific errors, and I request Dr. William Campbell to answer them. And irrespective where they use this, the Concordis approach or the conflict approach, as long as he's logical, he will never be able to prove scientifically all these 22 aspects I've told him. We agree in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. To him was revealed the Injil. This is not the Injil. It may contain part of God, but the other unscientific portion is not the word of God. I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 17, which says, فَوَيْلُلْ لِلَّذِينَ يَقْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابِ بِأَيْدِيهِمْ سُمَّا يَقُلُونَ حَاذَا مِنْ اِنْدِ اللَّهِ لِيَشْتَرُوا بِهِ ثَمْنًا كَلِلَّا فَوَيْلُلْ لَوْ مِمَّا قَدْ بَتَيْدِيهِمْ وَوَيْلُلْ لَوْ مِمَّا يَقْسِبُونَ Woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say this is from Allah to traffic with it for a miserable price. Woe to those for what they write, woe to those for what they earn. وَاخْر I would request our audience to bear, bear with us and maintain a due decorum for the continuation of the dialogue. Now I call upon Dr. William Campbell to present his response to Dr. Zakir Naik. Well, Dr. Nike has brought up some real problems. <laughs> and there are some of these problems that he has said, and I don't deny them, and I don't have good answers for them. But I will tell about... <laughs> We're going to make a mathematical study of prophecies. It's called the theory of probabilities. Estimate and will estimate the possibility that these prophecies could be fulfilled by chance. I now call upon Dr. Zakir Naik to present his response to Dr. William Campbell. <laughs> Dr. William Campbell only touched on two out of the 22 points I made, only two. You can only solve two problems, the six-day creation problem, and first day light came, and third day earth. But the remaining four problems yet is there. So Dr. William Campbell chose to say days a long period, and out of six, he solved two scientific errors. The remaining four of the creation of the universe, he does agree to it. That's good. The King James Version, as well as the New International Version, which Dr. William Campbell refers to, drink deadly poison, not eat, drink. Dr. William Campbell doesn't know there are Indians out here, 
surely many of you know Gujarati, Marathi, even I know. If I ask you, Puche. <laughs> Dr. William Campbell did not reply to my 20 points and he starts speaking about prophecy. What has prophecy to do with science in the Bible? If prophecy is the test, But even if there's one unfulfilled prophecy, the whole Bible is disproved with the word of God. I can give you a list of unfulfilled prophecy. According to your theory of theory of probability, Bible is not the word of God. Yeah. Irrespective whether you use the conflict approach or the concordance approach, if you're logical, you will not be able to take out a single verse of the Quran which is contradicting neither a single verse which is against established science. <laughs> if Dr. William Campbell cannot understand the Quran, that does not mean Quran is wrong. <laughs> Bible says in Job, chapter number 10, verse number 9 and 10, that we have made the human beings from clay, like poured out milk and curdled cheese. Poured out milk and curdled cheese is exact plagiarization from Hippocrates. Yes. I'd like to pose this question, or rather uh, this test, to Dr. William Campbell. Why don't you attempt the falsification test of the Bible given in the book of Mark, chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, and prove to the audience here, right now, that you are a true Christian believer. Um, my question is to Dr. Zakir Naik. The Christians explain the concept of tr Trinity scientifically by giving the example of water, which can be in three states, solid, liquid, and gas, in the form of ice, water, and vapor. Similarly, one God is a tri triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Is this explanation scientifically correct? The word Trinity is not there in the Bible, but it is there in the Quran. Dr. Zakir, you said there isn't any mistake in Quran. I see more than 20 mistakes in Arabic grammar. And I will tell you some of them. Brother, he said in Baqarah and Hajj, which is right, Asabi'un or Asabi'in. Number one. Number two. Brother, he one, said, one, brother one question one at a time, question. Yeah, please. but at the same uh, thing, he said in Surah Taha 63, <laughs> Mistake. <laughs> Can you explain that? And the book is referring to Abdul Fadi. Abdul Fadi, correct? Is the Quran infallible? I can yeah. see something. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, my side is good. <laughs> Dr. Campbell, since you are a medical doctor, could you please explain scientifically the various medical aspects that in the Bible regarding, because you didn't answer them in your rebuttal. For example, blood used as a disinfectant, bitter water test for adultery, and most importantly, that the woman is unclean for double the period when she gives birth to a daughter, then as compared to a son. Okay, Dr. Campbell, if you cannot answer the contradictions in Genesis regarding the creation, don't you think that the, that proves that the Bible is unscientific and therefore not from God? I admit that I have some problems with this. The Muslim yashtik, the Quran, is far superior to your yashtik, the science. Therefore, you should believe in Quran, which is far superior. Dr. Campbell agreed to Dr. Naik that the errors he showed are not wrong and that he can't answer them. So does this mean that Dr. Campbell agrees that the Bible has errors? So it's not the word of God. There are things in the Bible that I can't explain, that I don't have an answer for now. How can a son be two years older than the father? <laughs> Believe me, even, even in Hollywood film, you will not be able to produce it. <laughs>